Wes said, you've got to take your coat off to preach. I thought, yeah, I don't know that that's in the Bible, but I thought it seemed reasonable. <laughs> Otherwise, it looks like I'm just on the way out. I'm just, yeah, you've got a verse for it. Okay, well, tell it not in gaff. Um, oh, that's a King James reference. That's why nobody laughed. Um, happy Easter. Let's get back to this. Happy Easter. As the Greeks say, uh, Christos Anesti. And uh, yes, Alithos Anesti is, is, he is risen indeed. Christos Anesti, Christ is risen. Alithos Anesti. He's risen indeed. I must admit, though, uh, that for, for us, for my family, I don't know what it was like for your family growing up as a child, we, uh, we never really did Easter. Uh, we got the chocolate egg, that is the most important thing, in a, usually quite a large one, inside of which were more chocolate treats. They don't seem to do that anymore. But uh, they used to, in the old days, they used to. But we never really went to church uh, on, on Easter Sunday, or certainly not on Good Friday. We, ne- we never went to church anyway, generally. Or, or I don't ever remember discussing Jesus' death or resurrection through pretty much my whole childhood at home. I do remember a conversation at school, though, when uh, in the, uh, the sixth form common room, where Tony the pagan, a friend of mine, was taking on a Christian. I don't remember the Christian's name. Let's call him Lucian. And um, Tony, t- t- Tony, t- Tony said, uh, oh, listen, it wasn't such a big deal for Jesus to die on a cross because he knew that on the third day he'd be raised from the dead. And I remember thinking, good one, Tony. Tony, that's a good one. I'll remember that one, Tony. Tony the pagan won. Lucian the Christian, nil. But actually, it was more like, hold on a second, Tony, no. In order to minimize the cross, you've conceded that Jesus actually rose from the dead. Tony, you numpty. It was an own goal, in fact, to the other side. You can't win against these Christians. It's annoying. Now, obviously, he was was just messing about, but he also missed what the cross meant because the problem of the cross wasn't just the physical suffering. The physical suffering that Christ endured on the cross was, was significant, but that wasn't the real problem of the cross. The problem of the cross was the idea that I needed someone to die for me. That's the problem. The problem wasn't the, really the, the physical suffering. For Tony the pagan and Lex the pagan and any who are filled with pride today, the problem is Jesus had to die for you. And of course, the usual escape route is, what? I, I'm not sure I need Jesus to die. What do I need to be forgiven for? Okay, there are little things that I do, but look at that person over there. And what, how bad they are. And look at that. Well, look what they're doing over there. And how bad they are. If you want someone to save, go and save. If someone needs to be saved, it's them over there. Not me in here. If you're looking for sinners, look somewhere else. I'm not that bad. And so we, we kind of push Christ away. A bit like Peter did, actually, when he denied Christ. Just on the night when Jesus was arrested, Peter denied Christ three times. He pushed him away. And we read that the Lord turned and looked at Peter. There comes a moment in your life while you're busy justifying yourself and pushing Christ away that you're conscious that You are being looked at, that God knows. And Peter remembered, when when their eyes locked together, Peter remembered that Jesus had said to him, you'll deny me three times. And he went out and he wept bitterly. It is amazing the tricks 
that we play on ourselves to avoid the fact of a perfect, sinless man, humbly, deliberately, sacrificially taking our place, taking our punishment for our sins, hanging on a cross, bleeding out, crying out to rescue us, exchanging life for life to bring us to God that by his wounds we might be healed before him and reconciled to him. So these calendar moments, we're not big on the Christian calendar here at Jubilee, but these calendar moments, Christmas, Good Friday, and of course today, Easter Sunday, are good markers for us. They, they remind us, don't they, of the, the core kind of essentials of the Christian faith, how God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him would not perish, but would have eternal life. And today, as part of our Easter Sunday and as the launch of a new series, we're going to begin looking at one of the most powerful sections of the Bible. It's a, it's a section of ancient letters written by the Apostle John. Now, sometimes if you, you're interested in, a, in an historical figure, uh, it's, it's, you can read the statements or the books written by that person, but then you occasionally get testimony by someone who actually was with them. And you get a different perspective and you hear, wow, this person. John was actually with Jesus. John was with him. He saw what Jesus did. He heard the teaching and he was changed by the love that Jesus had for him. And these ancient letters teach us how to recognise and how to receive the love of God in our own lives and how to learn to love others as well. So we're just going to look at the opening phrases of John's first letter, the first four verses. The words will come up, I think, on the screen. 1 John 1 verses 1 to 4. And John begins, he always starts his stuff like, boom, he's in. There's no kind of slow build up like, you know, a symphony or a concerto. He just goes, bang. He's the Beethoven of, uh, of letter writers. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it and testified to it and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy <clears throat> complete. Some features of these letters. One of the features is robust truth-telling. That's John, robust truth-telling. He's the apostle of love, but his letters are surprisingly robust, quite challenging. They don't have like a soft filter on them. When John describes a spade, he doesn't call it a gardening implement primarily used for digging, comprising of a blade and a long handle. He calls a spade a spade. And that's a feature of his letters. And also there are these kind of short, simple statements. Sound very simple, almost childlike. And yet they are profound. And we're going to enjoy some of them as well. Some themes, obviously, the theme of love, loving God <clears throat> and loving one another and knowing that God is love. Light, 
that light has come into the world, that we receive the light and we must walk in that light. Relationships, what it means to be children of God, working out our relationships in love. And of course, the primary theme is knowing God, knowing God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So in these opening lines, we see three, three things. First of all, we see the physical Christ, the physical Christ. Just like the opening statement in his gospel, because John not only wrote these letters, he also wrote one of the four gospels, John begins with a declaration about Christ. That which was from the beginning, we have seen and our, our hands have touched. This is a physical Christ. As with all orthodox Christian statements, John believes that Jesus is the eternal Son of God who has been from the beginning, i.e. from before the creation of space and time, time of course being part of the creation, and that he physically appeared in time, lived, died, physically rose again from the dead. John is stating certainties. He claims that the eternal God appeared in time. The life appeared. We have seen it and testify to it. Now there are, of course, as you'd expect, non-Christian sources. The primary sources for the life of Christ are the very, very well-attested Gospels that we have in a New Testament. But there are also non-Christian sources for the life of Christ. No serious historian or classical scholar doubts that Jesus Christ was a real man who lived when the Bible says that he did in the place that the Bible says that he did and who did many of the things that it says that he did. The Jewish, I'm going to quote a Jewish historian and a Roman historian. The Jewish historian Josephus, writing about AD 93, reports that in AD 62, the Jewish high priest executed a man named James, the brother of Jesus, who was called the Christ clear historical reference to a Jesus who was called the Christ, whose brother was James, just like we see in the Bible. Rebecca McLaughlin writes, we find another reference to Jesus Christ in an early second century document by the Roman historian Cornelius Tacitus. Tacitus reports how the Emperor Nero blamed the great fire of Rome of AD 64 on, quote, a class of men loathed for their vices whom the crowd called Christians. Testus goes on to explain who these Christians were. Christus, the founder of the name, had undergone the death penalty in the reign of Tiberius <clears throat> by sentence of the procurator Pontius Pilatus and the pernicious superstition was checked for a moment only to break out once more, not merely in Judea, the home of the disease, but in Rome itself where all things horrible or shameful in the world collect and become fashionable. Again, lining up perfectly with what the Bible says about <clears throat> the dates and the death of Christ. And there are other references to the early followers of Christ who was clearly acknowledged to be a historical figure, wasn't in doubt. So the physical Christ, Jesus Christ physically appeared. He wasn't a ghost or a spirit or an idea or a principle or a, 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 some kind of spiritual step towards, you know, knowledge. He was a real man born in time. Secondly, though, we see not just the physical Christ, the glorious Christ. John is saying more than that he was just a man. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it and testify to it. Or let me give it to you from his gospel, the opening phrases of his gospel. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness. And the darkness has not overcome it. The word became flesh 
and made His dwelling among us, we have beheld His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. The glory of Christ is the central fact of heaven. The glory of Christ burst through into time and will burst through again at the end. The feeling you get as you read John is almost like, we can't believe it. Our hands handle this, which was from the beginning. Our very eyes, our own eyes beheld Him. We saw Him. He was in the world. And we had the privilege of walking with Him and hearing Him and seeing Him do these incredible things. Many of the early commentators believe that these phrases in 1 John, which our hands have handled, touched, etc., were a direct uh, reference to the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus. So after Jesus has died and been raised from the dead, they get to see Him again. <clears throat> Mary and the others had proclaimed the resurrection of Christ to the disciples and the disciples, the apostles were struggling. With, how could it possibly be true? Even though Jesus had told them, no, on the third day, I will rise again. He'd said it again and again and again, but how could it actually be? It can't be. And after a number of individual encounters, Jesus greeted the disciples as a group, which was important. Luke tells us in Luke 24, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. They were startled and frightened. Of course they were. What would you expect? Ah, yes. There's this glow over my head. Like, like they'll, in a few hundred years' time, they'll paint us like this. You know, it's, it's, this is inevitable. It wasn't inevitable. I mean, it was in the purposes of God, but it wasn't from their perspective. It's like, what is this? They were startled, they were frightened. They, straight away, rational thinking, reason, it's, this is, must be some kind of spirit or ghost. They think they're seeing a ghost. They don't believe in ghosts, but now they do. You know, it's like, there's got to be some... They thought they were seeing a ghost. And he said to them, why are you troubled? Why are you troubled? Why did doubts rise in your minds? Because he had been teaching them for three years that this would happen. Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost doesn't have flesh and bones. As you see, I have. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, difficult to describe exactly what they were feeling, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? I'm glad you sniggered a little bit at that because that is a bit unusual. And they gave him a piece of broiled fish. I said to Joe this morning, what's broiled fish? She said, well, it's kind of like grilled fish. And then we got the dictionaries out and broiled is exposed to direct heat and I suppose grilled is not direct flame. I don't know. Is broiled fish the same as grilled fish? I, this is important. This is an important point. Does anybody know? Yeah, it's the same. All right, I'm taking it there as absolutely authoritative. The fifth row back, about the middle, Grilled fish, and he took it and he ate it in their presence. Now, doesn't that seem an absolutely pedestrian thing to do after you've supposedly defeated sin and death and hell to basically say, you got anything to eat? You know, he's not it's like, oh, I've been dead for three days. I'm absolutely starving. You know, I mean, it wasn't that. Why, 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 why did he want, why did he want something to, he wanted to physically prove to them, he is alive, he is alive. And what a brilliant way, what a brilliant way to do it. This is the physical Christ giving evidence of the reality 
of his glory in defeating death. The fact that Jesus could eat grilled fish means death is defeated. It means sin has been overcome. It means heaven has been opened up. More fish, please. <laughs> but of course, in all of that, there was one person, one, just one person who was missing. Where he was, we're not told, but his name is forever remembered as Thomas, Thomas Didymus, the twin, Thomas the doubting one. Oh, maybe he was out making hot cross buns and beginning a new trend that had never before appeared. We don't know. Thomas wasn't there. And even though Thomas's closest friends are telling him, no, we have seen him alive from the dead, and he hears all these other stories, he still says, no way. It's not possible. It, it's just too far-fetched for him to believe. He cannot believe it. And in that sense, Thomas is a very modern man. And then everything changes, doesn't it? Jesus, I mean, I don't know why, but he, it's a week. He makes him wait for a week. It's a week later. And then Thomas sees the risen Christ for himself. And he does, his hands handle him. Jesus says, touch me and see, it's me. A week after the first disciples encounter him, Jesus appears to the whole group again. And he says to Thomas, stop doubting and believe. And Thomas says, my Lord and my God. Isn't that a wonderful thing? My Lord and my God. Now I know. It's the physical Christ declared the glorious Christ to Thomas in that moment. And Thomas went from saying, I don't believe it, to my Lord and my God. And Jesus doesn't say to Thomas, oh, Thomas, you're all over the place. One, one minute you're at that extreme, now you're over here calling me. Don't call me God. I'm just the son of God. I'm just an ordinary man that has found spiritual truths and, and you need to... No, Jesus doesn't say that to him. Jesus doesn't say to Thomas, you, you've gone over the top again, Thomas, by calling me God, which is what Thomas calls him, my God. That's a massive thing for a Jew to say to a man, my Lord and my God, you are God. That's what he's saying. And what does Jesus say? Because you've seen me, you have believed. You've believed because you've seen me. You have believed. Yes, I am God the Son. Because you've seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So for Thomas, seeing the physical Christ revealed the glory of Christ. And in that moment, he recognized that Jesus was and is Emmanuel, God with us, the eternal God, man it made man, God made man, God in human flesh. Now, none of us in this room has seen Christ in the same way as Thomas saw him, of course not. But even though we haven't seen him, we have believed. We have believed. Because in one way or another, those of us who are believers in Christ, we have encountered the risen Christ. We were told about him. Maybe you heard a sermon preached or you read something, or you asked questions with friends and you finally came to put your faith in Christ, but you've encountered him for yourself. And just as you can hear something and then the penny drops and you truly hear it, so there are different ways of seeing in John. There's, they saw and then they saw. Now mostly in the Gospels, that's they see an amazing miracle. He causes the wind and the waves to stop and they say, who is this man? He casts a demon out of an impossibly difficult situation. The demon goes, peace, the mind is, the, 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 the man's restored is in his right mind again. And they think, who is this man? They see, but then they see. They hear, but then they hear. And for us, it's the same. There's a seeing and there's a seeing. 
Look unto me and be saved, all the earth, says the Lord. Well, how do you look? <laughs> and that's us. We believe even though we haven't seen because the Holy Spirit has been sent to reveal Jesus Christ to you, to reveal to you that the thing you've been looking for all this time is Christ. I am the way and the truth and the life, says Jesus. And the Holy Spirit begins to draw you and you begin to realise this isn't just words. When Jesus says, follow me, there's a, a tug from the Holy Spirit of God. You don't know the source of it. You just think, what is happening? God is calling you to Himself. He's calling you to Himself. The disciples, they were stunned when they saw Him. They struggled to believe. Here He is, risen from the dead. And that experience caused them to move from incredulity, it can't be, to it is, to wonder and awe and surrender and worship. He is alive from the dead. It, it, it immediately releases awe and wonder and worship in your life. He's alive from the dead. The wonder is that the invisible God has been made visible in Jesus Christ. God in the flesh, God made man who lived, who died, who rose again from the dead. So the physical Christ, the glorious Christ, finally the life-giving Christ. The life-giving Christ. This, says John, we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testify to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. Now, you, you'll just have to forgive us if we keep on preaching Christ. It's not possible for us not to. To think that Christians should just keep silent is a mistake. We can't do it. I used to think that if there was such a thing as truth, then when someone finally found truth, they would, it, they would kind of be absorbed into it or it would be absorbed into them and then they would just shut up. <laughs> because they would, they would be at peace with themselves. So they wouldn't have to try and prove it or talk about it or do anything because if, if, they, if they finally, if there is truth with a big T and a human being finds that truth, then they would just, they would just be. And, and any attempt to... To, to talk about it would actually be kind of like they're trying to convince themselves that they've actually found it because they haven't. How wrong I was. How wrong I was. Because when you, when you actually find the truth with a big T, a great big massive historic T, you can't help but proclaim it. That's what John says. We proclaim this. Christianity has always been a source of activism, of change, of, of proclamation and preaching and of teaching and of healing and of building centres of education, of learning, of hospitals, of social do-gooding and of a myriad of private acts of compassion that are just beyond number. As soon as you encounter the truth, it just changes everything. It changes everything. It's just impossible to separate the love of God from His desire to make people's lives better. It's impossible to do it. 
It's impossible to separate the love of God from His desire to make people's lives better. And as soon as you encounter the love of God, something gets activated in you. We proclaim Him, says John. We proclaim the word of life. (laughs) It's just like you can't help it. It's impossible not to. When you've seen what we've seen, and it's so not like, oh, we're better, we're morally better than you, or we're morally, we're not back in that position of, well, just look at them over there and look at them over there. We're, but it's not that at all. It's that we found the life. We found treasure that we didn't even know was there. And we want to sell everything to get this treasure. We found the pearl of great price. We've, we've, we've stumbled into the kingdom of God. I mean, how could we stay silent about it while the world is scratching around in the dark, looking for solutions, looking for answers, trying to, you know, it's making a mess of it. It's what we do all the time. I had an illustration of that. You may not know the suffering I've gone through recently. You see Kyle in a sling. He was running yesterday for some strange and unknown reason. <laughs> Tripped and frightened. Fractured his elbow, which isn't funny. I'm not laughing about that at all. And nor should you. Shame on you for laughing. They're still going. So yesterday, there's this thing at, where is it, the spa, where if you collect enough stickers, you can get free knives. You'd think it was a good idea, wouldn't you? Behold the thumb. So... When you get these knives, there's a little protective thing on the top to stop you cutting yourself. (laughs) So after washing the knives, I thought, I'm going to put them in the drawer, but I want to put that protective thing on so that I don't cut myself or no one cuts themselves. So I'm trying to get the thing on, but I can't get it on. Suddenly there's a whoosh. Isn't that typical? Is that irony? That's called irony, isn't it? So... We try and do the right thing. We try and, you know, it's, and then that happens. It's like a tiny little picture of man's utter inability to please God apart from the gospel. He has to help us. We need his help. And when we find it, when we find grace that comes to us that we don't deserve, that we didn't even know was there, We have to proclaim, it's just impossible not to. The church proclaims, it's unstoppable. We, the church, is the bottle of Coke and the gospel is a pack of Mentos. You just, you cannot stop. It has to be proclaimed. It has to be declared. It has to go out from us. Even in the midst of suffering, that's true. Even when people are going through unbelievable difficulty, they still know God loves me. God loves us. There's still this proclamation. Even Read some of the stories that are coming out of Ukraine at the moment of Christians who are trusting God and serving others in the midst of having lost everything. The life appeared. The source of life, the resurrection life. This is the meaning of life. Hello, this is the meaning of life. You're looking for the meaning of your life, the purpose of your life. Here it is. Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. If you're weary and heavy laden, you need rest for your soul, come to me and I will give you rest, says the Lord Jesus. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Have you come to the Father? Have you stood at the foot of the cross and recognised what Christ has done for you in sacrificing his life in order that you might be reconciled to God? Have you seen the empty tomb, that he's alive again from the dead, that it's been done for you and now you can come? The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Today, if you hear hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Come to Christ. Let's stand together and we'll pray.